Thank you for joining us today. Um, the, the, yeah, the, the um, topic on our agenda is um, uh, uh, H 51, the bill related to fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, you shouldn't feel confined to, to speak to that. I know that um, your area of expertise is certainly broader than that, but um, that is something that our you know is before our committee. And, um, uh, you know, something we're interested in digging a little more deeply on. But appreciate you joining us today. And um, as I said, I think we've got a couple more members that are going to join us in the process. But um, thank you. Um, and if you could introduce yourself for the sure. record, we'll sure. record our hearings. Great. So thank you for having me. My, my name is John Erickson. I'm a professor of sustainability science and policy at the University of Vermont. Um, I work broadly in the area of ecological economics at UVM and part of the Gun Institute for Environment, where I do research on climate change policy, climate change economics, um, and I've been doing research in this area for, I was counting this morning, for over, over 25 years now. So I've been, been actively engaged in climate change research now for since the early 1990s. Um, so I, I am going to focus on, as, as I was asked to, on yep. the, the infrastructure bill that's before you. Um, I'm happy to take questions. I know there's a lot happening in this committee right now. So I'm happy to take questions um, on that bill or, or other, other things before you. Um, I certainly understand the urgency of acting, of doing something. Um, I certainly understand the challenges of state policy action, um, the, ch the challenges before Vermont. Um, and, and also the pros and cons of what you might think of as market-based approaches versus um, regulatory approaches. So I thought just to open things up, I would limit my remarks to three themes. Um, number one, the notion of carbon lock-in. We talk about re ongoing research around carbon lock-in uh, and how that's relevant to the questions before you in this committee here in Vermont. Number two, the financial concept of stranded assets. I think it's also a really important um, concept that uh, regulatory bodies, legislative bodies all around the world right now are struggling to think about. And number three, the merits of supply side climate policy, um, including the growing use of regulatory bans, which again, I thought I'd focus on this, um, is it 51, right? Yeah, House Bill 51. So carbon lock and stranded assets and supply side climate policy, and then pick any questions you'd like. So first, uh, the notion of carbon lock-in. Um, this is an idea that's been around for, well, going on 20 years now. Uh, it really started to appear in the literature around 1999, 2000. Um, probably one of the authors that's most cited and referred to is Dr. Gregory Unruh, who's a professor of sustainable business strategy and social innovation at George Mason University. So it's actually a concept that's really come from business schools to really understand the notion of carbon lock-in. Um, he's worked on this now for nearly 20 years, and he defines it as, bear with me because I'm going to unpack this sentence, a process of technological and institutional co-evolution driven by path-dependent increase in returns to scale. How do you like that? <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so let me unpack each of those ideas for you. A process of technological institutional co-evolution, so I want to unpack that first, driven by path-dependent, I want to unpack uh, and then the third idea is increasing returns to scale. So there's a huge literature on this, but if I could summarize technological institutional coevolution, big fancy way of saying that technical systems and governing institutions, governing institutions interact and they coevolve, right? And they tend to create relationships. And these relationships between technology and the policy bodies, po policy bodies such as yours. Uh, starts to, over time, become reinforcing relationships, right? We get used to a certain technical system, a certain lifestyle, a certain way of doing business. The idea of carbon lock-in is that we're all, <laughs> one way or another, dependent on carbon and have carbon-dependent uh, lifestyles. And our regulatory bodies, <coughs> institutional bodies, our very culture becomes intertwined with these technical systems. Second piece of that definition is the notion of path dependence. So we. The other fancy word we often use is positive feedbacks. Right? What happens in these co-evolving systems is you get reinforcing feedbacks, positive feedbacks. This dance between the technical infrastructure and the institutions and organizations that create, diffuse, and employ them becomes a way of kind of reinforcing these impacts. 
There's a lot of literature on technological path dependence or technological lock-in. Probably the most classic example is right in front of you here, your keyboard. The QWERTY keyboard, Q-W-E-R-T-Y, is a terribly inefficient way to type. <laughs> Uh, however, it was designed so that the hammers on the, the typewriter wouldn't get jammed up. And because we all started using QWERTY key keyboards, and because we all learned QWERTY keyboards, and our education system and our culture revolved around QWERTY keyboards, we can't get away from QWERTY keyboards. That's the idea of positive feedbacks. That's the idea of path dependence. And uh, you can probably, in your own head, think of path, path dependence within our carbon-based society. Um, and the third part of carbon lock-in is this notion of increasing returns to the scale. And this is, this is really a, a challenge for us to move away from uh, a carbon economy and to get onto other paths, uh, especially as Vermont aspires to be 90% renewables by 2050, to limit our greenhouse gas emissions according to our stat statutory goals, et cetera, et cetera. Increasing returns to scale has to do with a number of things. First is scale economies. So the idea comes straight from my own discipline of economics, right? that as you scale up, as you get to larger and larger scales, the unit costs keep going down, right? So for example, in the case of carbon lock-in, um, you know, there are big costs to building carbon infrastructure, as you know. There are big costs to building pipelines, to, to road networks, to transportation systems, to electrical systems. The big upfront cost, though, tends to create a lock-in to those systems, right? Because then it becomes really cheap on a per unit base basis to run those things. Once the road's in place, it's cheap to drive. Once the electric lines are in place, it's cheap to run those electrons. Once the pipeline's in place, it's cheap to run, run the new gas. Uh, that's the notion of increasing returns to scale. And it creates huge, huge barriers to entry. Uh, we also see learning economies as part of increasing returns to scale. Very simply, once you learn how to use a technology, once you learn the QWERTY keyboard, it's hard to change, right? It's hard to get off. So that also creates this notion of, of lock-in. Um, also, as we get used to working with new technologies or used to being part of the carbon economy, um, it reduces our uncertainty. The biggest challenge, for example, right now in electric vehicle markets is uncertainty, right? Like, you know how to run a gas-fueled car. You know where the gas stations are. You know if you run out of gas, there's lots and lots of options. The biggest challenge is adaptive expectations for um, moving, for example, our transportation system over to electric vehicles. And another aspect of increasing returns to scale is what we call network economies. These are, again, the interrelationships between technical systems and their users. So all of these things, technological institutional coevolution, path dependence, increasing returns to scale, create a kind of lock-in, right, to a, a technical, cultural, institutional system. And this idea of carbon lock-in that's been studied and, and empirically um, measured for well over 20 years now is uh, a dominant part of what you all are trying to figure out. Like, how do you unlock the lock-in, right? All those things that are locked out are because of, for example, increased returns to scale, right? Huge, huge barriers to entry to other kinds of technologies that, in the case of things you're considering, that are carbon saving and often more economic, right? Actually cost saving. But because you're locked into that system, you can't surpass the barriers to entry. So this carbon lock-in, to quote uh, Dr. Unruh, creates persistent market and policy failures that can inhibit the diffusion of carbon saving technologies despite their apparent environmental and economic advantages, right? So that's the rub. Again, I've been working on this for 25 years, and it's kind of like, when are we going to make a dent? When are we going to make a dent? When are we going to finally t turn the greenhouse gas curve? And despite all the great ideas, all the great technologies, all the cost-saving technologies that are out there, we can't seem to bend the curve because we are locked in. Uh, the market failures are very clear. Um, I believe this community is also looking at carbon pricing as, as, a, as an option. It's something that I've studied for just as long, 25 years. Uh, that's a kind of market failure when we don't price the external costs to this lock-in, right? Um, certain sectors get a pass and others get penalized be because of, of that lack of pricing, what we call in economics, externalities. The policy failures are very clear. Uh, there are powerful lobbies that are 
working against carbon pricing, working to keep our system in place because they've got a lot invested in it. Uh, they themselves are locked into the system. Um, we have, in the case of carbon lock-in, uh, persistent fossil fuel subsidies that are, again, tilting the playing field, tilting the advantage towards keeping us on these carbon pathways. So that's this notion of carbon lock-in, just from a conceptual point of view. But a lot of work has been published and inspired by Dr. Unruh's work, empirical studies, that I think are very, very, very relevant to the questions that are before this committee on the question of carbon lock-in from fossil fuel infrastructure. Uh, the International Energy Agency, um, they're the agency that's responsible for the coordination of all the energy, energy systems, energy data, and energy regula regulators, and energy agencies and ministries all around the world. Um, they have concluded that continued near term, so near term through 2020, this, this study was published a couple of years ago, so only a year from now, investment in conventional technologies instead of low carbon alternatives would increase investment costs fourfold in the long term. And the long term for them was out to 2035. So they were saying if we stay on, if we continue to make investments, continue to stay locked into a carbon economy, the investments in the alternatives will be four times as expensive in, in, in the future by, by, by 2035 if we don't start <coughs> turning the ship now. Um, Pete Erickson, who's from the Stockholm Environmental Institute, he's published extensively on the idea of carbon lock-in. Uh, he's probably published some of the most detailed studies looking at a combination of one, equipment lifetime, right? That's part of the lock-in. You, you put your money down into a new piece of equipment, a new piece of infrastructure, once it's in place, it's really cheap to operate it, right? So that's part of those economies of scale. He's looked at the scale of the increase in carbon dioxide emissions, <coughs> financial barriers to subsequent replacement with low carbon alternatives, much like the International Energy Agency did. And then what he calls techno-institutional techno mechanisms that further strengthen this high, high carbon technologies at the expense of low carbon alternatives. So I am, I am yeah, please interrupt me anytime. Okay, quick question for clarification. You said uh, it would cost four and a half times more after how many years if we? So they were looking at if we continue to invest in conventional technologies yeah. from 2020 to 2035, a 15-year period. <clears throat> okay, 15 years. The okay. expense of doing the shift at 2035 will be four times as expensive. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And why is that? Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, I'm going to explain that right now with, okay, this, right, with this graphic. So I am an economist, so I'm required to use a graphic at some point. Or an equation, your choice. Would you rather have a graph? I'll take a graph. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, this is a graphic that takes some unpacking from um, Dr. Erickson, no relation's work, uh, Pete Erickson from Stock Stockholm uh, Environmental Institute. So on the x-axis here, the horizontal axis, this is equipment lifetime in years. Okay, so these are literature estimates of how long this kind of investment will last. So you see the big circle there is coal power. So if we make if we continue to make investments as China has in coal powered electricity, right? Our country's actually not going in that direction right now. We're retiring coal coal, coal powered electricity. Um, the equipment lifetime, by their estimates, is in that 40 to 50 year time frame. Right? These are big investments. Um, I don't see. Pipelines on here. Where would they fall? In the yeah, I'm gonna. I, I get to that, but but they didn't specifically look at pipelines, but they looked at end uses of pipelines, right? So once you're using natural gas, for example, from a pipeline, the pipeline is just part of the transportation infrastructure to get it to you. But up here, gas heating furnaces, gas water heaters, uh, these kind of um, these circles at at 20 and 10 along the x-axis. Those are equipment lifetimes. So they're looking at average lifetimes of your house, your homeowner, and you put in a, a gas furnace, right? You're hoping to get 20 years, if not more, out of right. that gas my, furnace. My point being, so your furnace will last 20 years, but the pipeline will last 60. Yeah, so I, I, over the weekend, I looked for a good literature estimate of pipeline length of pipe time, and the best I could find was 50 years. Um, now, of course, that's gonna require maintenance, and leakage is a major issue of methane leaks from pipelines and everything else but the best that I can see is 50 years. Yep. The other thing I don't see on here is oil, oil heaters. Oil yeah, so this is not meant to be an exhaustive of everything. They, they did a number of kind of case studies, if you will, 
Um, if I could just unpack this a little further, the x-axis is equipment lifetime. The y-axis, the vertical axis, is what they're calling financial barrier to unlocking. And this is really key. This is what they estimate the carbon price would be needed for early retirement, right? To make these things uncompetitive, right? So you wouldn't wait to their full lifetime. You would retire these things sooner than the end of their lifetime. So you can see when you get up to uh, gas heating for furnaces or gas water heaters, um, you're getting upwards of a price on carbon of something north of $500 a ton of carbon dioxide to force an early retirement. Um, no legislature in the world is talking about pricing carbon at that high, right? But that's the kind of financial power that you would have to have to unlock an investment that's already been made, right? Because of these economies of scale. That's why I wanted to spend some time on that economies of scale idea because it's so, so important when we're thinking about technological lock-ins, or in this case, carbon lock-in. Um, the, the colors are these technical institutional effects, and I will share these papers with you if you want to get into the weeds of how they measure these things. Um, but for example, black is high, gray is low, and white is uh, medium, gray is medium, and white is low. So you see ice passenger vehicles, so that's internal combustion engines, have really high technical institutional effects, right? There's a road network, there's gas stations, there's a culture, there's a car culture, there's everything that kind of keeps reinforcing the internal combustion engine, right? So that's a really high kind of combination effect that keeps those things in place, even if they have short lifetimes or shorter lifetimes. And then lastly, the size of the circle, and this is really, really important. What they've done is they've said, okay, how much carbon could we admit, okay, this is a global study, to stay within the two degrees Celsius limit, right, that all governments, ours included, have agreed to, right, in principle, we want to stay below, at most, two degrees Celsius warming. How much carbon would we have, could we admit to stay below the two degrees Celsius? This is all the carbon, in business as usual, that we would burn above that. Right? So roughly, to stay within two degrees Celsius, we've got about 400, 500 gigatons, gigatons of carbon that we could still put into the atmosphere. Um, these circles, so, so the coal alone puts an extra, an extra 200 into the atmosphere if we stay locked into carbon on business as usual. So this is exactly the question that's before the world's governments, right? And the US government and our state governments, right? Is when do we say no to new carbon infrastructure that can last anywhere from 10 to 50 years, right? That won't be retired early unless there's a huge future carbon price, which I'm doubtful that we're gonna get a carbon price north of $100 a ton. Um, and that would have to unlock everything else that's part of the socio-technical transition. So just clar clarify. Please, if, yeah. If, 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 if we were to stay under, within our carbon budget, this page would be blank. It would be blank. Yep, yep. So what they've done is they've, they've compared two pathways. One is, which we all do when we model, I'm a modeler, business as usual, right? What have we been doing? What if we stay on that pathway? Right. The other pathway says, what would we have to do to get to two degrees Celsius? These circles show the difference right. only out to 2030. Right. If we stay in business, you will, if we blow past 2030, then we're in big trouble. But again, when you're talking we, you're talking... This is the world. This is the world. Absolutely. Right. Yep. So that's, that's the challenge for state policy initiatives, right? Like, what's our share of the problem? What are we going to do as a state? How are we going to take leadership on this? So um, I want to take this down to a very rudimentary level please, for please. somebody, you know, looking at this. Well, I'm going to break it down. I'm going to unpack this even more into some okay. real specific. So examples. I'll ask the question, and if you please. want to get to it in five please. minutes, that's great. But um, you know, when I look at, at graphs like this, I, I kind of look at it in the context of: Do I want to be in the northwest? Do I want to be in the southeast? <laughs> and what does it mean, uh, you know, if I'm on that, uh, if I'm on that curve, if you will? Um, so and now you're thinking about climate change impacts? Well, you know, I look at coal and I, and I say a uh, huge amount of um, carbon pollution there and, you know, one of the lowest cost um, impacts to take out of service. I'm not sure if that's a correct um, interpretation. 
Then I also look at internal combustion engines for passenger vehicles, cars. Yeah. And it looks like it's really expensive to take that out. Yeah. Um, the lock-in the lock-in is really strong. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but they're, you know, actually I'm driving a car now that's been around for 10 years. I don't know how often cars stick around for 17 years. Um, as I know, maybe they, as used vehicles, they yeah. stay on the road. These are all average average estimates, literature, literature yeah. estimates. But but I'm, I'm most interested in, um, you know, the, the internal combustion com uh, passenger vehicles. What does it say that that circle is up on the kind of the, the northeast quadrant, if you will. Yep. Um, and what does it mean that techno institutional effects are, are high? That's the only black uh, circle. Yeah. Effect. So that means these uh, these these, these increasing returns, these lock-ins are really strong, right? Because the technical, the cultural, the governmental are so in. We often use the word entangled. Are so entangled that they are reinforcing a transportation system built on internal combustion engines, right? So we got gas stations. We got roads. It's all got, there. Once it's built, it's really low cost to operate it. Yeah. That's the that's the question before you guys, right? Yeah. Once it's built. Yeah. Okay. So to take your example further between cars and coal, we know that coal plants are being retired, right? We know that coal companies in the United States are going bankrupt. We know that coal had the coal use in this country has peaked and is in de is declining in the US, in Europe, in most of Central and Latin America. The big exception for coal is Asia right now. And this gra graph would predict that. <laughs> this graph here, most of that circle right there is not it's not the United States. Okay. Most of that coal circle is China and India. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, but I need mean, to predict it in the context of uh, if you if your goal is to reduce carbon emissions, it's less expensive to take carbon yep. to, to take coal offline. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So the way I read this is that <clears throat> this is the, on, on the vertical scale, this is the carbon price that would make it economically uh, feasible to um, retire, to retire those early. resources early. 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 Right. So, so if, I, if today <clears throat> I bought a gas fire so like, heater for my house, right? right? <clears throat> uh, what price would the price of that gas have to be where I'd say, geez, that was stupid. I'm going to retire this and do something else. So, so it's not feasible to actually use carbon pricing as a mechanism to drive down our, our greenhouse gas emissions. I'm going to come back to that because and I really think it's going to, it's going to be a take on What I'm going with this is that we shouldn't be doing carbon pricing. What we should be doing is uh, a tax on fossil fuels that we could then use to invest in uh, other technologies that would leave some of these <coughs> technologies in place, but not use them as much. Call it what you want. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, electric vehicles uh, on the road. It's not going to displace all the uh, uh, internal combustion engines, but as you grow that quantity, you're going to reduce the amount. Right. right. Uh, same thing with uh, an oil furnace or a gas furnace. You can keep that in place as backup heating. But if you transition to uh, cold climate heat pumps or something like that, you're mm -hmm. transitioning the energy source from fossil fuels to something more renewable. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, call it what you want. What you described, <coughs> what you just described to me is, is carbon pricing, right? You're trying to, in, in one case, tilt the, the marketplace, tilt the incentives so that I still have the choice of doing what I want, but I've just made one. Well, you're not relying on the actual price of carbon to actually drive behavior. You're relying on a lower price of carbon to it's a revenue reinvest. It's a revenue it's a revenue source. That's a revenue source, yeah. yeah. So, so in that case, you get what's called in, in the market incentive literature a double dividend, right? The first dividend is the price. Mm -hmm. um, partly corrects behavior. But then what you do with that money is the second dividend. Mm -hmm. How do you invest that? You invest it to further reduce um, uh, carbon lock-in as, as part of what I'm talking about here. Yep. Great. I'm sorry for that painful graph. Was, was that helpful or useful? Yeah. yeah. It's really one of the sort of, I would love to see a graph like this done for Vermont so we have a, not a global graph that doesn't exist yet. One small question is a little dot next to the ice. Definitely yes. Is, is, that, is, that a, is that really a dot? So that is gas road vehicles, so that's natural, natural gas. gas vehicles. Yep. Yep. 
Hmm. Yep. Now, one misleading part of this graph is it's only at the burner emissions. So it's CO2 emissions at the burner, right? This analysis is now being corrected for what you would call life cycle greenhouse gas emissions, right? It would make natural gas, if you looked at life cycle emissions because of methane leakage, look much, much worse than this graph. Uh, there was a study done at Cornell University that compared um, natural gas, an uh, energy system based on natural gas versus energy system based on coal. And natural gas was worse than coal because it, even at small leakage rates of, of methane because methane is such a potent uh, greenhouse gas. But that's a, that's a side story that we can come back to if you'd like. Um, just going back to the small doubts you have one there for cement kilns. Mm -hmm. And in the building trades, we talk about the high embedded energy in concrete. Yeah. But it looks like, relatively speaking, it's... So it, it's back. relative to use, right? So on a per unit, cement is really greenhouse gas intensive. But the total amount of, of cement being produced, and this is usual, is certainly a whole lot less than the new coal power, for example. So these are scaled to use and, and carbon dioxide impact. Unfortunately, they're not scaled to a full life cycle impact of greenhouse gases, right? Because each of these, each of these, yeah, yeah. Uh, but they, they all note that in, in their articles, um, you know, that, that they're, what, what was not included in the analysis. So if I could, the conclusion from the carbon lock-in literature, okay, is that policymakers and investors, because a lot of their target is the business community, policymakers and investors should assess carbon lock in and then, quote, this is quoting Dr. Unruh, focus intention on investments that rated highly in all or most indicators. So, say those with lifetimes longer than a particular planning threshold. So, what's the planning threshold? Is it 10 years? Is it 20 years? Is it 30? If your planning threshold is five years, then Let's bring on the coal. 50 years, let's bring on the coal, right? <laughs> if your planning threshold, like the IPC says, C says in their latest 1.5 degree report, that we've got six years to turn these curves around, right? Then anything that has a carbon lock-in beyond the six year period, uh, under this logic, wouldn't be such a good idea. So the focus, at, focus attention on investments that rated highly in all or most indicators, lifetimes longer than a particular planning threshold, so I think that's something to wrestle with. What's your planning threshold? For which the cost of unlocking is beyond reasonably foreseeable carbon prices. Because that's the other mechanism. If energy gets really expensive, the unlocking will happen by itself. And which are subject to high techno institutional effects. So think of all the cultural and institutional and government and that whole entanglement, right? If that's really strong, then that's also a really tough, tough to unlock. Um, so you're saying, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. were you saying that that would be a recommended investment or a not recommended so the, investment? The, 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 so the policymakers should assess carbon lock-in based on those three dimensions, right? Okay. Lifetime, what kind of economic climate would be required to unlock things, and then this, this entanglement of technical institutional effects, right? Okay. So if you're considering a pipeline or a new highway, or, I don't know, an, an investment in a Vermont aerospace industry, right? <laughs> these, are all, mm -hmm. these are all carbon lock-in questions, right? And we have to ask, what's the lifetime? What's the economic cl climate, right? The cost of carbon? And what's the kind of technical institutional effect to, to lock-in? Now, the IPCC, the International Energy Agency would all say that we're already past that point. Right? New investments in infrastructure that lasts any, anything beyond five years is too much in terms of lock-in. So I want to pivot now to escaping the lock-in and, and introduce my second idea, which is this idea of stranded assets, which I think is the financial argument. Right. Um, so the challenge is that the beneficiaries of climate action are billions of the world's citizens, right? But we're diffuse. We're uncoordinated. We lack political power. The, that's the benefit side. The cost side of climate action is immediate, and it's focused on a highly coordinated, powerful few. So all the carbon lock-in literature usually ends with that in the conclusion, right? That like the benefits are diffuse, but uncoordinated and unpowerful. The costs are concentrated, coordinated, and quite powerful. 
And that's part of the technical institutional kind of entanglement. So therefore, the reason that a lot of this work is coming out of the finance industry, the insurance industry, the economics um, discipline, is because of this idea of stranded assets. So this is kind of like the flip, the other side of the coin of carbon lock-in, right? So this literature is making the case of carbon lock-in and how difficult it is to get out of a locked-in system once you've made the investment. The stranded asset piece says, well, once you've made the investment or the investments that are currently in place, what would determine if they were stranded, meaning you couldn't use them? Um, the financial definition of stranded asset assets are assets that have suffered from unanticipated or premature write-downs, devaluations, or conversion to liabilities. So these are assets owned by a government, by a, a company, or, or by an individual person that are stranded. They can't be used. Um, so again, it's the sort of other side of the coin of the notion of carbon lock-in. So reasons for stranded assets, and they're often framed as financial in a kind of financial risk assessment. Um, the biggest reason for for thinking about stranded assets is investment risk. So again. Um, if you do the math and you look at what is currently on the books in terms of coal, oil, and gas, on the books, not stuff that we're hoping to discover someday, right? But the coal, oil, and gas reserves that are on the private books or public books, okay, a lot of oil, gas, and coal is owned, owned by uh, state governments. Um, what's currently on the books and what's left that we could burn to stay below the two degree threshold? Okay, 60 to 80 percent is the number that would be unburnable. It's on the books. 60 to 80 percent of the carbon that we know is in the ground is unburnable if we were to stay below the two degrees Celsius threshold. So another way to think about this is if the global policy community got serious and actually started ratcheting down um, uh, climate risk from greenhouse <coughs> gas emissions, that one way or another, all of these investments in oil, gas, and coal, 60 to 80% of them would not be brought up and spewed into the atmosphere. The regulatory risk, therefore, is, um, is huge. Um, again, either through international arrangements, national arrangements, or state arrangements, if we actually take seriously what we can, what's left to put into the atmosphere, the climate impact assessment um, would say we have to leave most of it, 68% in the ground. Um, we're starting to see case law develop around uh, National Environmental Policy Act, for example, that's expanding the idea of what an environmental impact assessment is to include climate risk. We're seeing insurance companies move in this direction. A lot of this, this research on unburnable carbon is actually financed by the insurance industry. Uh, there's also market risk. Um, we are seeing that our, already some renewables are out competing new, new fossil fuel investments. Not the locked in stuff, right? Because it's already built, it's really cheap to run. But new wind installations are already out competing new, <coughs> new uh, natural gas fired electricity. New wind electricity is already out competing new natural gas electricity. So there's a market risk too by getting too locked in by making new investments in uh, fossil fuel infrastructure. So there are still active um, lease auctions, exploration auctions. Sounds like by this analysis, that's just a bad business investment. Is well, let me jump ahead here in my notes here. Investments in coal, oil, gas, so what you're referring to, exploration, extraction, and transport, all those investments globally are averaging a, a trillion dollars annually, okay? and are poised to exceed $20 trillion from 2017 to 2040 in, in the International Energy Agency's new policy scenario. That scenario, so call that like a business as usual scenario, is, according to climate science, is gonna blow us way past the two degree threshold. Are the investments. Those are the investments. That's the investments in these, because of the lock, all the lock-in that I'm talking about, right? These investments are teed up <laughs> and are fighting this kind of investment risk, regulatory risk, market risk, to, to stay in a carbon economy, to stay in a carbon economy. Now we know that there's some attempts to 
untangle that. The divestment campaigns is one attempt to tangle that. And the divestments, the, divest, the divestment campaigns are now in the, the trillions, low trillions of dollars. Um, but who knows if it's going to be enough to un untangle these. And we know that there are climate risks themselves on these very assets, right? The big stink over ExxonMobil, right, was that while they were funding the kind of anti-climate science, in this hand over here, they were funding climate adaptation strategies. And they purposefully raised the level of their um, deep sea oil platforms in anticipation of rising sea level. So they know what the climate risks are to their very infrastructure, right? This is this is well documented. Yes. So, um, just jumping ahead in the scenario, uh, if we were to burn up all these locked in, or, uh, should I say locked in assets or uh, on the books assets? Assets. Sure. sure. Uh, how much of an increase in global temperature would we be looking at? beyond two degrees. I mean, two degrees is bad enough. Two degrees means no Arctic ice. Right, we're already a little bit below one degree in yeah. terms of what the warming has been. Um, and uh, we're already seeing the impacts of that. Um, two degrees, even just even by the end of the century, if not sooner, is, is, um, is the reason why we have an international agreement to stay below two degrees. Right. If we do this kind of thing, and burn the unburnable. Um, we we the, the biggest fear is I talked about feedbacks earlier, is that we get into positive feedbacks where we get these run, runaway effects, right? So the latest literature on this is called Hot House Earth, <laughs> and it sort of tries to estimate the probability of passing thresholds where you'll start to cycle into a positive feedback, right? And by then, um, the drawing of the permafrost, all the bets are off. Yeah, so. Forth. so when you heat the world, it creates feedbacks that create more emissions, that create more heat, right? There's simple social feedbacks, right? If summers get warmer in Vermont, we all turn our, on our air conditioners, right, longer. It used to be, you didn't really have to air condition your house like for maybe a couple weeks a year in Vermont. You know, now it's like a couple months a year. Um, that's a feedback. But you, you mentioned the methane that's trapped in the permafrost. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the worst case scenario if that were to be released. Which is happening now. Yeah, so that's that's being measured now, and, and that's just why there's so much. Uh, the um, Arctic is warming uh, the fastest, so the farther you get away from the equator, the higher the warming rate is. Right, and so understanding those feedbacks are really important. Okay. Happy to get into lots of climate science. Sixty minutes had a segment yesterday uh, on a uh, scientist in the Arc in the Siberian in Siberia, who has been working on it. And he showed that um, it used to be that you couldn't get a shovel into the ground where he's, he's at. Yeah. And now he's down about six feet right, before you get to frozen, frozen ground. And so you've got six feet of soil there that uh, is now capable of melting and releasing the methane. So I, I've been working in terrible. what season? I've been working in climate science and policy my whole professional life, and um, climate scientists are, believe it or not, a very conservative bunch. <laughs> they will not publish stuff unless they are pretty damn sure that they've got a leg to stand on. I can tell you from experience, the peer review process is absolutely brutal, <laughs> right? Sometimes it can take me two to three years to get a paper out because it's been through rounds of peer review and revisions, and, and it's like, oh my god. You finally get the paper out, and you're like, okay, <laughs> wish I could have said this three years ago. But it's a it's a very conservative process, and so a lot of this is what the state house, what folks in Vermont do, kind of believe in science that creates microphones and computers and lights and everything else, or do you not? Um, but didn't prepare a testimony on that, but we could go on that, that tangent if you'd like. Scott, I just had a quick clarification: About sixty to seventy, sixty to eighty percent of uh, uh, unburnable the, the, the unburnable yeah. is actually also what the fossil fuel companies list on their books as assets. Is that right? Right. This, so this is not even taking into account um, probabilities of new explorations, right. Right. which they continue this to is, do. These are just book values. Fossil fuel companies and state governments. So a lot of fossil fuels are state owned. Right. So okay. Norway's fossil fuel, right. Nigeria's fossil fuel, right. Saudi Arabia's fossil fuels, those are all state owned. Yeah. Right. Right. So either on private books or public books. Right. Yeah. 
this, but this is all um, accounted for yeah. and book value. And in the case of private companies, it's actually the value of the company. So a lot of this stranded asset literature is again coming from finance, you know, right? Because it's saying there is regulatory risk here, there is climate risk, you know, there is market risk, right? right? What is the risk of of all of that? And then there are a few few attempts to kind of get right at the heart of it. The, the divestment campaign is exactly that, right? Or insurance company? Insurance companies are investors, basically. Insurance companies are, are financing the bulk of this research. But what I mean is they're 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 in, they're in, investors in the market. They're looking at, uh, at, at what's sure. trying to yield a return because that's what they have money yeah. that they collect and they invest yeah. it so that they can you know uh, are they divesting or are private insurance companies beginning to divest? They're becoming way more conservative of what policies they write. Let's put it that way, especially in coastal communities. Um, well, that's in terms of policies. I guess I'm thinking about the investment side. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I know that um, a lot of the legacy money from the carbon economy, for example, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, the Rockefeller Foundation, they have all divested. And, and their money came from fossil fuel. And they've, they've <laughs> Rockefeller divested. divested. Yep. Yeah, their foundation side. Yeah. 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 So, um, and then there's a, if you, you can kind of rank oil companies from um, conservative to more progressive, you know. Some of the more um, European-based oil companies like British Petroleum are actually releasing reports that mirror a lot of this. Um, ExxonMobil tends to be a little more on the conservative side. Yeah. You yeah. basically answered the question I had in that. So what insurance companies are we talking about? What are we? Uh, any kind of insurance company you can think of. So insuring real estate value, insuring the companies themselves, insuring, I mean, I, I think there's not, not a too distant future where um, um, oil companies are going to have a hard time doing high risk investments, right, like deep sea drilling because of the exposure in the insurance, insurance industry. At what point will insurance industry say, I'm not insuring your platform, um, so therefore it ain't going to happen. They've already seen the kind of impact of, of, of the divestment community and the activist community. You know, the companies that ship from the Seattle, Washington area have lost millions of dollars because of fossil fuel activism. How does that insurance piece or intervention uh, compare to the insurance companies now that aren't wanting to insure a house because it needs a new roof, but the people can't afford the new roof? I mean. How, how are we? I don't know the answer to that. I mean, we're talking insurance. If you think of insurance of the carbon locked in economy, mm -hmm. it's, it's billions of dollars, right? If you think of insurance in the economy that climate can impact, so the fact that the, the, the uh, I forget the statistic on how many, what percent of the world's population live within 10 miles of the coast, <laughs> it's huge. So if you think of that as an insurance liability, that's huge as well. So that's why insurance companies, for example, funded the, the stranded assets analysis, the unburnable carbon question. Yeah. One, one perspective, Mark, is the similarity you now to interest in like the tobacco class action suits, interest in the same petroleum industry has known about this for decades and have been hiding information from us which affects everyone as a class. So in, in that respect, it, it involves everyone. Yeah. That, that's why I don't, I don't know the statistic, but how many attorney generals, ours included, have filed suit against ExxonMobil for exactly this reason. Of you knew this, you buried it, you, you, you yourself made investments to adapt to climate change that, in one hand, you were preparing for, and the other hand, you were denying. So that's a, that's a, that's a, strand, that's a stranded asset question, right? A stranded asset question. So my last theme, so um, carbon lock-in, stranded assets, which is largely a financial question, right? And then supply-side climate policy, which is before you in Bill 51. Um, so there was just a special issue in the Journal of Climatic Change, which is an excellent, excellent journal on climate change research, uh, published this past September, that I just discovered over the weekend in preparing for this testimony on fossil fuel supply and climate policy. And the lead article in, in this issue talks about the so-called road less taken of supply side policy. For the most part, most work on climate policies has been on the demand side. 
how do we use market instruments? How do we use market incentives? How do we use carbon pricing, right? To incentivize the shift, right? To incentivize the move away from carbon lock-in and towards a different, a different kind of uh, energy path. Um, because of the urgency now of, of climate action, uh, there has been a sort of market shift in the economics literature to say, yes, we need the incentives. Yes, we need to change the prices. Yes, we need to get rid of subsidies of things that we don't want anymore and rethink our taxation system, rethink our pricing system, encourage consumers to make different choices, right? But that's only one part of it, right? We're at a point now where we have to really think about regulatory instruments. Um, so they lay out the following rationale, and this is, I'll end here and we can keep talking. Um, applying, su applying supply side and demand side measures together, uh, according to this analysis, would increase the scale of emission reductions, right? So the idea is if you were combining rise, rising carbon prices with regulatory efforts, right, you get kind of a double, double whammy, right? You get the opportunity at each mitigation cost as you're creeping up, as you're creeping up the vertical axis here, right, and changing the economic climate of, of the decisions that are being made, especially infrastructure decisions, and at the same time, you're, you're trying to reduce these lock-in effects through regulatory measures. Um, they talk about how supply-side policies and actions will tend to slow investment in fossil fuel production and trade infrastructure, right? That's the whole intent. Uh, limiting the extent of carbon lock-in, so if you will, also limiting the extent of stranded assets, financial risk, uh, and a whole other part of literature talks about the carbon bubble, right? Like if we really all of a sudden get serious on, about this, the stranded assets piece starts to look like a carbon bubble, just like the housing bubble. Um, this in turn can lower future mitigation costs. I already talked about that, right? The sooner we do this, the cheaper it is to make the transition. If we continue to be locked in, the more expensive it gets out into the future of making the transition. Um, reducing stranded asset risk, which I've talked about, and reducing carbon entanglement, this sort of socio-political influence of fossil fuel interests that we see in as a predominant feature of carbon lock-in. Um, they also talk about how supply-side policies may increase moral pressure and public support for climate action. And I think this is, this is important because action is more readily observable, right? The closure or avoidance of a coal mine or a gas pipeline is so much more observable than the thousands of energy efficiency actions that are spread across individuals, right? So that's an important aspect of supply-side policy. Actors are more readily identifiable. Again, coal industry, oil industry, investors uh, are identifiable in a supply side policy. And the consequences are relatively certain and exact. <laughs> as much as I talk about carbon pricing, right, the consequences are not exact, right? We don't know what the incentive will do, especially at the very, very, very small incentives that are being discussed in the State House, right? and how these, these incentives will ramp up slowly over a 10-year implementation period. Um, we know because of carbon lock-in that it takes a huge incentive to really change uh, people's minds. Um, fewer projects and facilities produce fossil fuels than use them, right? Supply-side policy, right? The, who you're focused your policy on is fewer. Granted, they're more concentrated and more powerful, but there's far fewer of producers then there are users. Demand side policy puts the emphasis on changing the user's behavior, right? <coughs> Supply side policy puts the, the, the attention directly on the producers or the transporters or the fossil fuel infrastructure itself. Uh, and then finally, they mentioned that supply constraining policies may help to counteract the potential for resource owners, anticipating an increasingly stringent future carbon policies and prices to accelerate production in the near term. This has been called the green paradox, right? That part of the kind of financial assessment is if this stuff is in the pipeline and there's regulatory risk or there's new laws coming down or potential infrastructure bans, right? We've seen in other situations that that accelerates the, the kind of last dying breath of an industry tries to, for example, get all the fossil fuels to market before they know that the party's over. So that's another aspect of supply-side policies, the sooner. 
So I know you're considering infrastructure ban, and I think that in combination with demand side policies is, is an example, right? One example of many of breaking this kind of carbon lock-in. And it's one of the few examples that I can think of that has certainty, right? A ban is certain. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Go ahead, Robin. Um, so one of the questions that I struggle with, John, is um, in not just creating in, in in not just creating the same situation, but with different products. Yeah. You know, um, and and in the same way, you know, one of the things that the free market, such as it is, does really well is is innovation. Mm -hmm. And if we choose to incentivize lithium-ion batteries, and we are locked into lithium-ion, right. create the same situation. It's a policymaker choice versus a, a market choice. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how we can capture that the dynamism of, of innovation in the free market and the supply side guidance, or and demand side, both, yeah. of policy. Well, I think for that reason, um, you can think of a regulatory approach that would require a new infrastructure or a regulatory approach that would ban infrastructure, right? The, there's far, I, I hope you're convinced that there's a lot of certainty around, from the scientific community that we've got this unburnable carbon problem. Mm -hmm. And the more we invest in carbon lock-in, the farther and harder it's going to be to change, right? So I, I feel there's great certainty around regulatory reach, right, mm -hmm. to ban a pathway that we're on that we know is a losing path, right? There would be far less certainty to then, the flip side of that would be then to um, mandate a new technology, a new, you used a new battery technology or a new driving technology or a new power technology, right? That's where the flip side of, of the market, the market pricing mechanisms, that would say, we're just kind of discouraging this choice and encouraging this whole suite of choices over here. But market-based instruments still allow the user through their, all the lock-in reasons for their experience, their culture, the, the networking, all of those things keep things cheap. That's why right. lock-in works. It keeps things cheap, right? So you can imagine keeping things cheap in a renewable energy economy by providing more choice across that. So nowhere do I see that you're considering legislation that is requiring alternative A by banning alternative B. You're just mm -hmm. saying let's ban alternative B because we know a lot of certainty about that and then let's see what happens over here. Thank yeah. And I looked at another study, for example, of other um, uh, countries or regions that were kind of at the end of the pipe, if you will. And uh, like, I mean, this transition fuel narrative of natural gas in this state is, um, if you would mind my saying, is kind of ridiculous. Um, that narrative was maybe valid 20 years ago, but in the kind of carbon lock-in that we see now, um, transition, like, no, I mean, the lock-in, the numbers, the unburnable carbon, there's no time for any sort of transition from carbon fuel A to carbon fuel B to a non-carbon fuel. Um, Vermont just happened to be kind of at the end of the road in terms of this natural gas transition that, that um, the United States has seen. There's an interesting study that I looked at in Ireland, same, same question. Ireland was kind of at the end of the pipeline, mm -hmm. and there's a whole infrastructure study on Ireland to say, should we at this point in 2019 invest in huge natural gas infrastructure as the transition? And they, they did all this kind of scenario analysis and costing it all out, then their answer was it's too late for that kind of transition. Ireland needs to take a different path. And, and again, uh, in the case of Ireland, um, the a new investment in wind power is actually cheaper than new investment in gas, gas powered electricity. But that's sometimes driven by... Like, it's gotta be a good wind resource. In Scottish power, yeah. Scottish National Power Company is owned by Iberdrola. So they made the transition from coal to wind without a bridge, right. driven by self-interest. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, that's, that's <laughs> that kind of techno-institutional entanglement piece, right? Mm -hmm. Like, who are the owners? Who are the investors? Um, in our case, um, I, I mean, the discussion is around expanding pipelines with Vermont Gas, owned by Gas Metro. 
major investor of Gas Metro is the pipeline companies that are expanding. So, you know, there's a lot of kind of lock-in, right? That's part of part of that story. And this kind of analytical analysis uh, is, is done for exactly that reason. Yeah, so um, in terms of uh, combining, I guess, pricing and, and uh, regulation, um, our, our ability to regulate is kind of limited because we've only got, uh, we only regulate electricity and natural gas. So we need something about that on the natural gas side, but in terms of fossil fuels like uh, fuel oil and diesel and things like that, the gasoline, um, we're kind of limited. So. Uh, something like the uh, uh, Transportation Climate Initiative or Western Climate Initiative where you put a, a cap on the amount of carbon that you could that, that can be generated and keep ratcheting that down. Yep. Uh, might be a way to regulate the unregulated fuels. The problem that I see with, uh, with those kind of initiatives though is that they are too gradual and, and it will take too long to implement in the time frame that we have to avoid this two degrees Celsius uh, yep. uh, temperature increase. Um, so given that, <laughs> what other strategies uh, can we use? Well, I, I, and again, I'll, I'll send you, there's about five or six key articles that I referenced in here that I'll, that I'll send. Um, but one is this special issue on supply side policies. I did I print that one out somewhere here. There it is. And they show, a, there's a whole suite, including regulatory bans, of economic instruments on the supply side. And their point is exactly yours, right? That the vast majority of the climate policy and climate economics literature has been about demand side approaches, right? But the context in 2019 versus 1993, when I first started doing this work, is dramatically different, right? So the supply side approaches now are, including regulatory bans, right? Banning new pipeline infrastructure is being used. Banning new, new oil or coal exploration is being used around the world. Um, these kind of moratoriums, so King County, Washington, put a moratorium on all, all new gas infrastructure. Um, so it's exactly similar to the ban that you're considering, but focused on natural gas infrastructures. They're, they're currently within a moratorium. And again, um, economists argue that that's an inefficient way Right, to intervene in a marketplace. But when you're talking about a stranded asset that we know is an inefficient, both in economic and environmental terms, to continue on, then it kind of becomes an efficient way, right? It becomes a, a targeted for a certain way versus market approaches. The nice part about cap and trade, right, is that there's a lot of certainty over the cap, but no, little less than certainty over the trade. Um, so we can ratchet the cap cap down, but unless we ratchet it quickly, we won't get as far as we need to, according to the whole stranded assets ideal. I, I, I Great question. So I was been concerned. The reason I mentioned the insurance company thing. Yep. Um, again, looking in reality, at reality for Vermonters that I know. Yep. If they're if they have to spend eight or ten thousand dollars on putting a railing around their deck and securing a part of the foundation. Have insurance that eight thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars isn't going to go towards an electric vehicle or maybe a new heating system. Sure, sure. Then you talk about okay, that's where the state or the government steps in for incentivizing or helping out or whatever. But I guess my looking at it is where where is this money coming from? I mean, you you, you just can't. I don't see that that amount of money being out there to to do everything. That, you're saying we should do right. Well, if you if you look at just uh, the the pipeline expansion into Addison County, right? If you look at the amount of money that was put into that, that comes from the Vermont ratepayer, right? Imagine how uh, those millions of dollars could be put towards weatherization. Uh, they could have been put towards uh, moving towards electrification of heating. They could have put into high performance wood heating, right? There are other things that don't contribute to the carbon lock-in. Millions of dollars, right, could go towards a different pathway. So it's, it's all about a regulatory choice. Um, you know, this bill doesn't propose you intervening in everyone's household and saying you must put in, you, you, you're no longer allowed to use propane to heat your home, right? This is at, at the point of regulation, which is at the, uh, the public service uh, 
Public Utility Thank you, Public Utility Commission. Thank you, Public Utility Commission, right? Which is at the scale of big projects with public interest, right? I can't think of a bigger project with public interest than climate policy. Um, in fact, I, I provided testimony um, during the hearings for, for the pipeline, uh, talked all about the full cycle uh, cost assessment that should be done with considering natural gas, talked about stranded assets and carbon lock-in, um, but the regulatory kind of question that they were asked, as you know, they decided to expand, to, to grant permission to expand the pipeline. Um, so I, I feel like now you're sort of saying, okay, um, Public Service Commission, we're going to give you a, a different chart. You are or you aren't, whether this bill gets out of your community or not, remains to be seen. Right, but it's, it's all at that point of, I mean, there, there will be a, a, a time, if we continue on this trajectory, where regulatory bodies are going to start to dictate what can and can't be used at the household level, right? That's going to be a way more costly form of regulation than at this moment right now, where the little tiny state of Vermont is starting to say, do we want to continue investing in the public interest, right? That's the mandate of the department, in the public interest in continued carbon lock-in, or are we going to draw a line in the sand to say, the evidence is clear, <laughs> we can't continue down this road. The market forces aren't enough by themselves to do this. Carbon pricing has been talked about in this building for at least three years, right? That's not coming out anytime soon. Um, so you kind of got your hands tied at, at this point. I have one other question. Please, yeah. So take a country like Venezuela, for example, right now. Are they part of the Paris Climate Agreement? And, and if they are, do you think they're trying to, at this point, meet any goals around climate change? I believe the only two countries that, are, well, we're still part of the Paris Climate Agreement, believe it or not. So there's a process to back up. Obviously, President Trump has signaled a back out. But the only two countries that are not part of the Paris Climate Agreement, the United States and Venezuela. That's a good example. <laughs> um, they have subsidized the heck out of... They, Venezuela, there's only a few countries in the world that have cheaper gas prices than the United States. Um, they're all either de developing countries, very poor countries, or OPEC countries like Saudi Arabia and Venezuela. Um, Venezuela is one of just a handful of countries that has cheaper ga gas at the pump, gas prices, oil prices, natural gas prices than the United States. Um, I'm going to prepare this for my testimony, but uh, our average price of gasoline right now, oh, I'm going to get this wrong, is something like, um, I have in my notebook here. It's well below the world average. Let me just say that. Well below the world average. And again, the only countries that are below us is um, a handful of, of very poor countries um, and the oil exporting countries. And the difference is, is not the commodity price, because the commodity price is, 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 is it's fairly, it's stable, fairly around, stable around the world. The difference is, is how governments treat it, whether governments tax it or subsidize it. Yeah. Yeah, so every other country in the world has raised, almost every other country except for Venezuela, has raised their gas taxes from 1993 till today, incrementally over time, right? Um, so these differences in prices are almost entirely due to gas taxation. The United States, federal level, we haven't raised our gas tax since 1993. Uh, Bush one raised it, followed by Clinton, and it hasn't been raised since whereas the rest of the world has continued to try to use the market to wean ourselves from carbon locking. Thank you, Jim. Happy I'm to sorry. come talk about carbon pricing any time. It's, sure. it's another favorite topic of mine. Well, we've got you. Please. <laughs> so if you've already, I apologize for being late. That's if okay. you've already answered this question, I'll talk to you afterwards. Okay. I'm happy to talk to you afterwards anyway. Um, with regard to thinking about carbon tax mm -hmm. and thinking about what's needed, um, you know, if we accelerate um, getting off of fossil fuels, do we have do we have the production capability for like uh, 
transportation, so more electric vehicles. Like, wh where would we need to focus? Um, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so we were talking. We were talking about. I don't, I don't know when you came in, but the pros and cons between market-based instruments like carbon pricing yeah. or regulatory instruments like, like infrastructure bans, yeah. right? Uh, and I was trying to make the case that the combination of the two are going to be required. The pricing strategies try to kind of change the, the marketplace and the kinds of decisions that the individual makes versus the companies make. Yeah. The infrastructure is more of the kind of company and targeted, yeah. more of a targeting approach. Um, it's kind of, I mean, with, with significant carbon pricing, right, we'll see changes in behavior. So, uh, so we saw this with the gas price spikes in 2008, 2009. Yeah. Uh, we saw a huge surge in bus ridership in, in Vermont, where we have buses, especially in Chittenden County. Um, Which I don't live in, by the way. Yep, yep. <laughs> so, um, we'll, but we also see big changes in inf infrastructure investments, right? So, um, I, I know there's very, you know, so ri ridership, car, it's not just, because this is part of the carbon locking story, right? If I've just bought a car or if I've bought a car in the last 10 years, it's gonna be really hard for me to get off the car and get into something else, right? So I have to think about ride shares, um, carpooling. Um, I think it's really interesting to see the private car companies like is the enterprise that's now going into these um, yeah, car share, car share programs, right? Um, going from a two car family to a one car family, right? So um, that's, a, that's a big part. Um, link, I mean, a big part, and we could have a whole this conversation about unlocking carbon locking in the transportation sector. A very simple thing is just linking your trips, right? So if you leave your house and go to work and come home, and then leave your house and go shopping and come home, and leave your house and bring the kids to the soccer game and go home, if you link those trips, right, we see huge reductions in, uh, in greenhouse gas emissions. Vermont's, Vermont has a big challenge in the transportation sector. It's something like 41, 42 percent of our greenhouse gas emissions come from transportation, which is way higher than the national average. Um, by census definition, we're the most rural state in the country. Um, by um, so we've got some challenges. We drive a lot per capita, but so I think a lot of the policy attention. That's where carbon pricing as a strategy is really important for that sector, for transportation in particular. Unless you guys want to start banning internal combustion engines, yeah. I don't think that'll go over well. <laughs> I, I would love to follow up with you. Right? Please. Again, I apologize. Please. Actually, I have one, one clarification. We have a couple minutes. Um, I think one of the things that you said around supply side versus versus uh, <coughs> demand, demand side, side mm -hmm. um, was that um, by, for example, banning new pipelines, um, you, you, I think what you said was that you build public support, that is, you, uh, you, uh, you, you, you get a focused, focused public support. Right. Did, did you say that? I, I, I did. I, this I, review of supply-side policies, yeah. one of the points they make yeah. is that supply-side policies, this is quoting from them, may increase moral support, moral pressure and public support for climate action Yeah. because climate action is more readily observable, actors are more readily identifiable, and consequences are relatively certain and exact, right? There's not a lot of mystery of what the effect's gonna be. But I'm just thinking about examples of, well, on the demand side, I suppose, of, of uh, the public not supporting uh, uh, sort of gov government action on this, on this issue, as, for example, in France, when they tried to raise the, the price, demand side, but when they tried to raise the price of petroleum, yep. uh, and we have this big, huge um, protest movement, right? Um, so because the, tar the target in that case was on the consumers themselves, right? It's on the consumers themselves, right? Versus oh, so the target on the producer. Right. But I guess I'm just wondering whether the idea that uh, there's, that, that, that targeting, by targeting, I mean, we only have not, a, a natural gas company, by targeting the natural gas company that, that in, in, in Vermont, that that is a, uh, a popular thing. Yeah versus being the kind of thing that also trigger, triggers uh, sort of a public outcry. Right, right. Well, you could look at the kind of weight of the testimony regarding the hearings that the Public Service Commission put together. Um, the, it's, it's pretty 
diverse yeah. Oh, yeah. group of constituents, right? Sure. That we're arguing either for or against. Yeah. 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 I mean, I guess there's no answer. I was just wanted to make sure that I heard you correctly. About yeah. That. Yeah. No, that's it, it's 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 that point that the carbon locking literature points to, right? Yeah. Are you going to design your policies? on the beneficiary side, right? And that's really difficult because the beneficiaries of climate action, again, are billions of us. Yeah. And we're scattered and we're uncoordinated and we lack political power. Yeah. And most of that but on the cost side, yeah. right, it's concentrated, it's only a few actors, but they got a lot of political power <laughs> because of this carbon lock-in, yeah. right? Because the, the entanglement of government, regulators, Right, there's, there's a whole other talk I could give on um, uh, what's it called? It's like a regulatory lock-in. Regulatory capture. Regulatory capture. Thank yeah. you. That's yeah. the word I was looking yeah. for. Yeah. Um, I don't often use that word with policymakers, but yeah, regulatory capture yeah. is a really important aspect. Yeah. And we know regulatory capture exists in spades in the fossil fuel industry, oh, yeah. right? Because of carbon locking. So it's like. It's the bold choices before you are, do we going to act on climate or not? Right. And if you're going to, you have to break carbon lock-in. Can you do it with incentives? Absolutely. It takes, it's, it's a longer process. It's a little less certain. It's part of definitely unraveling entanglement of the transportation sector. But on other things, in terms of big infrastructure investments that are in the pipeline, so to speak, um, it's, it's a whole lot less, um, it's a whole, a lot more obvious that supply side policies like restrictions or bans, their time is uh, here, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, last question. It's very provocative, yeah. Mr. <laughs> Chair. <laughs> <laughs> it's occurring to me. What would your, um, what would your thoughts be on banning the sale of gasoline? Well, I think um, it's we've got this uh, six to seven year window the IPCC claims to bend the greenhouse gas curve. Beyond that, um, it kind of depends on what kind of world you want your kids and grandkids to live in, right? Because we're looking at serious climate disruption, according to all the science, according, I'm not going to say to the conservative science, because all of the predictions so far have blown past the conservative science in terms of the, the impacts. Um, the climate system is, is a very delicate balancing act and with us loading, the physics of us loading the system that we are, to take carbon that took millions of years to lock it up and then to put it back in the atmosphere over just, it's not even for a few centuries, more than half of the carbon ever released into the atmosphere has happened since 1990. 1990? 1990. That's the momentum of carbon locking. Up till 1990, half. Since 1990, right, 20, what are we, 29 years, half. It's incredible. Since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, half's been put in the atmosphere. So it's, it's a lot of momentum that we got to overturn in a very short period of time. Whether, whether we ever got to a gasoline ban or a car ban, or I, I, I don't know. You're welcome. Thank you so much. So we're going to shift gears pretty quickly here. Um, we have uh, Ms. Stacy here. Yes. Okay. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Stacy, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, do you mind just opening the door just yeah. for a minute to let more, just to let more oxygen in? <laughs> we have a lot of CO2 in this uh, level of the building. <laughs> I want to make sure you've got enough oxygen for your Thank you, room. thank you. No, thank you for joining us. Um, uh, so, Stacey, we record all our um, hearings, so if you can introduce yourself for the record, and then, um, yeah, uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Stacey Briggs, Senior Manager, uh, State Legislative Affairs, T-Mobile. Yep. And I am here from Tennessee. I um, have 14 states. 14 able lobbyists, John being one of my most capable, so I'm very happy to have her here in the state for me, covering everything. And I'm delighted to be here. I've uh, 
I've been trying to get here uh, and it didn't snow, so I'm really, really happy. <laughs> <laughs> <Every day. laughs> yes, um, I brought. I was smart and brought my family last time because my husband's from Michigan and he could drive and snow. And it did snow. It was about this time of year too. Um, I I really appreciate the opportunity. I think we've emailed the presentation that I have, but I've got extra copies if anybody wants to. Is it on our website? It is. Okay. okay. It is, and and. Uh, Representative Brickland, sorry to interrupt, but it's much like I e emailed you in January or February whenever I was in here, but it's been updated, so it's, it, but it's very do similar you want to it that. on the projector? Oh, if you want to do that, that's fine, yes, that's... Whatever's easiest for you, honestly. I'm probably not going to go word for word, no, but it has... Uh, then we can just do it exactly how we're doing it now. And if you want it's to fun to look at. It's colorful. Okay. Mm -hmm. like you Let's bring it up. <laughs> we, we like pictures. We like pictures. It has lots of pictures. Um, it really just goes through the, the company history, and I think John probably uh, gave you the, all of the, the good background. But we have uh, 80 million customers now, and T-Mobile really started in earnest after, um, after AT&T tried to buy T-Mobile in 2000. Uh, I don't know that. 2003. Anyway, it's been about six years since we've been on our own, uh, uh, really, really deciding and determining to, to go out and do everything we can to get new customers. And in order to do that, um, we are now, uh, in order to do that, we like to compete on network and customer care. Those are the two things that, uh, uh, and in doing that, we are hopefully, we are now up to the third largest provider and with 80 million customers and we've grown by 50 million customers organically over the last five years. 22 quarters in a row with over a million new customers. So it's a, it's a robust company and we're building, uh, building very fast. The way we're keeping our customers is through network and customer care. So our network that we're building is 5G. We're merging with Sprint and we're trying to purchase Sprint. Sprint is our, the fourth largest. We are the third largest. They have about 50, 50 million customers. That would put us at, uh, you know, still number three, but not too far behind the others. So we would be number three still. But this would allow us, we think, to elevate our deployment and to elevate our customers to deploy, especially in rural areas, which is hugely important to Vermont. I am sad to say that Vermont is one state, I think maybe the only state where we don't have any stores. And that's hopefully, I know I talked to the, the uh, sales VP not long ago and I know they're in the works, I know where they're going and, and it's coming. They will not put a store in unless the network is really tested and you know there's no problem, any problem with the network. So if you see a store, I haven't had any, any problem. I dropped one call since I've been here and I, been uh, the same every trip I've had here. We roam, uh, used to roam on AT&T's network and we are building out into rural areas with our own network. And our vision for that is to use 600 megahertz spectrum to get there. This 600 megahertz spectrum will allow us to get into rural areas, but also will allow us to have 5G coverage in those rural areas. And yes. Please do stop me with any questions. So just with regard to uh, the FirstNet project, which we know is being built out um, in that spectrum, are you expecting that you're competing head to head? Can you compare and contrast? Well, <laughs> you know, it's, your you it's your testimony. Uh, we, yes, we yes. Well, it's, um, it, I, I would say that we are building out our network um, in a different way because we've got this new spectrum, and let me just tell you how we got it. And I'll pass around a map that shows you where our 600 megahertz spectrum is going in the state of Vermont. And like I said, we've been, we've been roaming on AT&T's network, and this would allow us to have the same customer, you can pass that around, you can have the same customer experience anywhere you go in the country, so you'll be using our network. And it is broadcast spectrum, so it travels about 25 miles. And we're putting it in strategic areas so that hopefully we won't have to fill in with any additional spectrum in order to get to those 5G speeds. But because it's a brand new network, it will be very, very fast, and it will allow for us to compete with landline cable, with all kinds of 
you know, lightning speeds ten times faster than you see today, and that will be in rural areas. Is um, so your build out is that to um, do you continue plan to continue roaming on AT and T and filling in gaps with your own or creating your own to get us off off roaming to get yes. off no AT more roaming. Um, how we, we do use, uh, I know like U.S. Cellular in some of the rural areas, but I don't think they're here in Maine. They have a really great network. So, so to be cynical yes. for a moment, because that's part of my job, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, what we see is carriers um, duplicating coverage in, in population areas and not getting out into the rural areas for all of the reasons that they're not there now. And I'm wondering how this will be different. Well, it, it is a rural play. It is our intention mm -hmm. to to make it available in rural areas. And because we have this, I think part of the technology that's been missing is you don't have this for us, is broad coverage spectrum. So we haven't been able to get there on our own. So if you have more, uh, it's kind of a chicken and egg. You have to have the network, and then you get the customers, and then you expand you know, the customer base. The more customers you have, it's uh, the more competition. Yes, you go to the same uh, dense areas first, but that's we are intending to be uh, available in all of these areas. And if I may follow up, is, is, is there, as a rural state, is there the customer base to carve off a chunk from AT&T and Verizon? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> How are we going to be building? <laughs> I think that's the short answer. Uh, you, you've got not only do we want the same experience everywhere in the country uh, because we would be a brand new provider, brand new stores, low prices, you know, yes, we'd be a very robust competitor and we've managed to take all of the growth in the industry, just just marketing, customer care, and network. network. Thanks. Yes. When you, when you talk about the 25 mile uh, range, does that take into effect the uh, Hills Valleys yes. and all that? that it's, if you think about yes. a broadcast, you know, antenna that you can put up and mm -hmm. you can grab programming from the air, you know, that's the whole idea of free, free TV. It's the same idea that that's available and it goes through, penetrates walls and it goes you know, valleys and deep depths and, and everything. Else. So okay. it is so very will, robust. Will your network antennas be uh, um, at high elevations? Say, for instance, okay, I, I can get uh, channel three over the air on my TV because they're broadcasting from Mount Mansfield. But um, I have a hard time getting channel 22 from across the lake <laughs> because uh, I don't really know why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, Oh, it wouldn't be picking up the, the video feeds, yeah, we, uh -huh. so it would be it would be really a different technology. But yes, yeah. would, we would uh, hope that it would be absolutely available, no matter you know the elevation. And estimated timeline for this build out? Yes, we purchase the spectrum, and then it takes about 36 months to clear. But we are robustly getting that. Developed. You'll see on that map that I just passed around, um, it's got different timelines. And I do have, without giving you too many, too much information here, I do have a map that kind of shows you the difference between our projected 5G coverage in. So I keep misplacing my map. This is 2024, but that's our standalone. If we don't buy Sprint, here we go. And if we do buy Sprint, we expect. So you said that you, that T-Mobile has purchased the Spectrum, or is T-Mobile 600 megahertz is, is fully purchased and being deployed at a rapid rate ahead of schedule. Yes. But then the 36 month period was uh, started about 18 months ago, so we expect to have it fully deployed in the next probably I think that's 2020. 18 months. Yes. Okay. Yes. This is our coverage in 2021 uh, projected if we were to buy, if, if the Sprint merger goes through. And the timing is, we hope that to be finished by the end of this quarter, which we, we're in the second quarter now, so we hope that to be complete by the end of the second quarter. And the heat is on. You know, we've been going through it for about a year, and it's uh, been through many of the regulatory hurdles. It has to be approved by 
Department of Justice, and the FCC. So those are the two entities. We have been approved by CFIUS, which is the foreign ownership. Could have been a you know big problem with both foreign, foreign um, companies. Um, so I have a quick uh, technology question. Sure. I'm a little embarrassed to ask it with Seth in the room. Um, but uh, I, I uh, read ahead to your fifth slide, and um, there's a, I guess I'll call it a graphic, um, about your deployment of 600 megahertz broad, that should be bandwidth, um, right there in the middle. Of, and, and underneath it, you've got LTE and 5G. So LTE and 5G are two technologies um, that you would utilize in um, rolling out or, or using the 600 megahertz broadband, or yes. bandwidth. Bandwidth, that's right. Um, currently, I'm guessing you're more focused on LTE, your current yes. structure. Yeah. And in the future, the focus will be more on 5G, um, exclusively on 5G, LTE, you're kind of leaving behind. I'm just kind of curious how that breaks out. Yes, and it's a great question, actually. Um, and unlike the other generations, we wouldn't decommission the network that we have now. Which is the LTE. Which is the LTE, 4G LTE. That's the competitive networks that we're all building right now. This enhances 4G LTE. 5G is really a speed, and so you're really getting to those 10 times the speed because you're building capacity, but the underlying network would still be the 4G LTE network. We're building on top of that. So we don't have to replace the network that we've that we've been building. And, and 5G would be, using the term loosely urban, um, infill? Well, and that's, that's I think, you know, my mission is to make sure, yes, with 600 megahertz, we're actually rural 5G. So you, it's a speed. So in the urban areas, in order to get to those speeds where you have a dense population, you might need a small cell 5G technology. So that we would have that as well. But Sprint has mid-band spectrum. And you'll see in that map, this, the dark pink is where um, we would expect to take their spectrum and refarm it to handle the capacity in the more uh, between the towers, if you will, uh, in, in the distance between the towers. The small cell technology, 5G technology, is very limited in, in, uh, in how far the range um, that it can go. But the speed should all be the same. So it's, it's just how much capacity you have on your network, whether it's urban or rural. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> it's. Uh, I wanted to mention our customer care and a couple of innovative. Uh, yeah, I didn't mean to take that. Oh no, no, this is uh, happening quickly, and and I think we're. You know, I think the good news is Vermont is on the map, and we're trying to build it out as fast as we can. I I think we can expect to see a store. Any day, really. I, I think it's it's absolutely coming. Um, I'm not privy to when that is, but I, would, I will try to find out. I uh, wanted to mention two, two things that are sort of revolutionary in T-Mobile's care, care arena. And one is the team of experts. We actually have 17 domestic call centers. With the merger, we're going to add five, uh, five or more uh, call centers. We just announced one would be potentially in Rochester, New York, and we also have a call center in Maine, uh, in Oakland, Maine, north of near Water. Water. What are Waterville. Waterville, thanks, Waterville. Um, this, what we've done with CARE is, we think, going to change. And we've been doing it for a couple of years. We just announced it last August. It's called Team of Experts. So instead of calling and the phone call goes anywhere to any first available rep, your number will be associated with the same 50 reps at the same call center every time you call. Just think about that. So every time you call, hey, is so-and-so there? <laughs> and they might actually be there. Or, oh, they went somewhere, or you know, uh, they're on break, or you know, really a much more personalized experience, but also the ability to integrate with uh, network operations as well as retail to have a much more seamless, I mean, 
it's they, they have something called the rage study and telecom is right up there every <laughs> single time apparently since the mid 50s telecom is the number one thing to make people mad in fact my daughter since they're not here i can talk bad about it says mom i respect you she's 16 until you get on the phone with comcast customer care and that's, <laughs> i had one problem and now i have 10 and let me spell them out for you but uh you know it just seems to get the runaround quite a bit and uh we've got great marketing around it with a team of experts not only helps the customer <laughs> resolve their issues quickly there's no more automated system there you can choose to to go through the automated menu i don't know why you would do that but um the idea is to also elevate the care representative knowing that you own the customer and you know that you you can uh, do the job and you can get get that resolved we take great care of our care reps in fact when we became a public company we all got stock in the company and for many of the care folks that was the first time we'd ever own stock in their life and we keep getting um, stock every year so it's that part's been a pretty nice nice thing it keeps going up started at 17 and we're almost 70 today that's not stock to us <laughs> but it's a good trajectory we'll, we'll take it um, the other thing I wanted to mention was our uh, ability to stop robocalls we're sort of leading the pack in the spoofing and robocall arena. I know it's a huge issue for everyone. It's a, um, you know, it's a drain on everybody's network. It's a terrible thing for customers. Nobody likes it at all. Um, so we are, we've been very active in DC developing a new standard that the FCC is likely to make a, you know, a mandated standard and it's called stir shaken. And I'm not exactly sure how it technically works, but we can pick out a number and verify the number before it's sent through and you know, just you know in an instant so we're able to verify that the caller is legitimate or it comes up scam likely and you can block that person forever all that is uh, no charge to the customer we blocked we just announced uh, last week we blocked 10 billion calls in two years blocked 10 billion calls in two years. how do they get your own number right it's a spoofing yeah it's, so they, it's i know that is Creepy. Yeah. Yeah. So um, is the uh, when, when you do this verification, is the ability, uh, not the ability, but the decision to block that number at the user end, or is it at the? Uh, it's before the, the, It's verified before we complete the call. It's verified before you continue the call. Yes. So we would never get. It. I mean, you, we would never get the call. Yeah. You, you can block it completely, um, but it will come up scam like. Yeah, I, I guess what I'm wondering is um, you decide that it's spam and that gets blocked, and I never get the call, right? The call gets verified. The call gets verified. The, call, the number gets verified, and, and then it, it goes through. through. Yes. Oh, you can take through. it if you want. You can take it if you want. You can take it if you want, but something comes up telling you it's probably yes. okay. It's the next slide. Okay. Oh. That's Ta da! Scam block and scam All ID. Right. It's very simple to use, and uh, customers really, really do like it. We can't catch everyone. You know, they're they're using algorithms. They're international bad actors. I think if you answer the call once. So that scam block allows you to say, hey. If if anything's identified as scam likely, then don't even give it to me. Let me stop that one for now. You could, you could spend a lot of time blocking that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's several that get blocked coming through. But that's called shaking and stir, and we we do think that that will be the standard that all the providers <laughs> will uh, will move to uh, within the year, but then likely to be mandated at the Um, can, can I ask a side question on, on, on that? Um, if a call comes through and you think it's a, and you think it's likely a, a scam or a spammer or whatever, um, and you don't don't answer it, but it goes to voicemail, <coughs> is it then like answering it? I, I I always let it go to voicemail, and they are always we need you to call right now. You yeah. know, so and, somebody does leave a voicemail. Yeah. yeah, I just wondered if that if that. It's the same thing as answering it, in fact, in terms of 
confirming that the number is live. It, they will. Uh, a lot of times, they'll actually leave the voicemail as the recorded yeah. call. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Side question. Yes. I got a voicemail the other day. It was in Chinese. Yeah. <laughs> I get that. One. The Asian one. Yeah. <laughs> well. Thank you for your time today. I've got some other handouts. We have two great websites that will really, um, I go on there, I can't believe we have so much information on some of these websites. But howmobileworks.com has, I've left, a, I'm gonna leave a few of the uh, more popular, I think, did I get those two? No. Um, the more popular uh, <laughs> explainers. Right there. there we go. Yeah. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, you know, going through the anatomy of the network, just kind of the basics of how the network works, how we get this 600 megahertz spectrum, all the stuff I said, you can go back and, and, and read more about it. Uh, we also have more information about um, smart cities and launching some of those technologies as well as preparing for the Internet of Things and, you know, personal safety and, and all of that. We will have... Uh, uh, a competitive product. We haven't launched it in Vermont yet, but we will have a, a first responder product similar to, to uh, FirstNet. It's a priority network for first responders. The way I understand that it works is every first responder has to, um, has to file their number with the Department of Homeland Security, and we must provide priority for that number. So we all have that requirement um, already priority network service. In other words, you can put them through first and, and so we have those products. That's our sales division and uh, we're, we're getting there. We have a guy. We have a sales guy. <laughs> Thank you. Sir. I have a, a lot of cards here that I can leave in case anybody has any questions and handouts, but I know we're I'll on this paperless. With, um, Sarah, over here. So can... Practically paperless. Yeah. <laughs> Try. <laughs> Trying. Sometimes I like the paper myself. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So we're going to pray for uh, we're going to pray for 19 minutes, and then uh, uh, Becky is going to join us to go through a Senate bill within three months. Right. Wasserman Legislative Council. Um, I am going to walk through S12, which is an act relating to the state energy management program. This uh, was language that was put into the 2015 budget bill. And what, just as an overview, what it's doing is extending the length of the of preliminary period um, of the state energy management program from four to eight years. And this is a program that's within the Department of Buildings and General Services um, that addresses energy management measures, implementation of energy efficiency and conservation, and the use of renewable energy resources in state buildings and facilities. And um, the way the language from the 2015 uh, budget was drafted was that the during this preliminary four-year period, the program was uh, supported by Efficiency Vermont. Supported by? It? Yes. Meaning they paid for it? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and they will continue to for the renewal period as well? Um, yeah, so I can walk through that. Um, in uh, section one, in uh, subdivision B1, um, this is where you'll, uh, the, you'll see the change that is extending the preliminary period of the program. So it's, it's saying that uh, the Department and Efficiency Vermont will um, have the program for a preliminary period of four years. So this is extending it um, to eight years um, to do this uh, preliminary uh, program. And then in subdivision B2 is language relating is language relating to um, Efficiency Vermont's provision of support for the program. So this is saying that um, Efficiency Vermont will support 
provide support for the personnel to implement the program. Um, and so the language was from fiscal years 2016 to 2019, so this is extending that period to 2023. And then on page three, uh, at the top of the page, there's also uh, language with respect to the building project manager position. Um, so this is uh, extending that support from uh, two year, two, four year, two, should be to eight year limited service or consulting positions. Two eight years, sorry. I, I think this, there's an it's error the way yeah. the, well, there's a, a space in the way the language is. Um, I'll, I'll see if I can get that fixed. Um, so two eight year limited service or consulting positions. Um, and then uh, there is also uh, language in subdivision B where it says that Efficiency Vermont shall provide up to 290000 during the first, during the fiscal year 2016. And um, this new language says that for the remaining seven fiscal years of the program, Efficiency Vermont shall provide an additional amount sufficient to support the annual salary and benefit adjust adjustments for these positions. So this is where the language is that's saying that Efficiency Vermont will support these positions through the term of the preliminary period. So I don't have a count on my fingers in the public. Uh, I just want to be clear <laughs> that all these numbers take us out through fiscal 23. That is the that was the goal. Okay. Hopefully they're all correct. <laughs> okay. It should be changing it from a, a four-year period to an eight-year period, which should be fiscal year 23. Right, so instead of any this fiscal year. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, in subsection... Question? Page <coughs> three. Um, subsection B. Under this subdivision, uh, EVT shall provide up to $290,000 in fiscal 2016. For the remaining seven fiscal years, EVT shall provide an additional amount. Is that 290 as a base all the way through, and then two salaries on top of that? Um, I, my interpretation of that was that it shall pro provide um, the amount that is needed to support annual salary and benefit adjustments. That's why there's not a set amount there. But I wonder if the word additional shall provide an additional amount necessary, but additional amount sufficient to support. That says to me it's on top of the 290,000? Right, I think, but I don't know that so it's, it's a set amount every year, so right. I, perhaps JFO can come in and talk about <coughs> that could be, if the language could be clarified to speak to a specific amount of money. If, if I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to pin it to it. I'm just, so that 290 is an annual allocation, and then there are two positions on top of that. Two yeah, positions? Or? No, it's, it says salary and benefit adjustments, so any raises. Any raises to those salaries. Oh, so the additional. Uh, I, I, I was I was not, and perhaps I, I can look into this further. I was not reading that to be the that is the amount of the. Didn't sound like anybody else was either. The, <laughs> okay, I, I was reading it to be an additional amount to support the the adjustments, not the amount of the right, not the amount of the salaries. So the bottom of page three in subsection D, um, this is adding, um, this is extending the, there's an annual reporting requirement um, that was in the original language, so this would be extending that reporting requirement until 2023. And then on page four, as part of that report um, in the, in 2019, which was the last year of the, of the preliminary period, there was a re requirement that there, the report contained an evaluation of the program 
and any recommendations, including whether or not to continue the program. So this is adding that um, this rec these recommendations would be included in the, fi in the, the new final year of the program of, in 2023. So what, when was the 2019 report submitted? Um, has it been? Yes, it was. I think it was in December of 2018. Uh, or early January. I can I can look it up and have it sent to the committee. Uh, Definitely question. Also, just wonder if we receive that report. That's all. I know it's it's on the, the legislative web page. I just have a general jurisdictional question. I know that um, the House Government Operations Committee has been doing some work in this area. Um, and uh, I'm fine with this bill being here, it's certainly in energy, but uh, are you familiar with any jurisdictional things that they're working on, kind of in the management of state buildings and energy efficiency? I'm actually not aware of what they're working on. Okay. Is it a specific bill that they're working on? I just okay. generally speaking, talk to the chair of that committee about energy efficiency in state-owned buildings that the Government Operations Committee was interested in. So okay. I, I will talk to her about this. I was just curious. Okay, I, I think there's probably some overlapping jurisdiction. Other, you know, for example, institutions yep. cover state buildings yep. too. So mm -hmm. okay. I don't know the specific issue they're looking at. Okay, thanks. So didn't we put money in the budget for these positions? I'm presuming we did, since this is saying that we should. But I, I don't know the answer. I thought I thought there was a line item in there. I'm not a line item, but um. Didn't we fund um, $350,000, something like that, for Efficiency Vermont to help with the building and general services? Oh, what you were looking at from um, when you had the, recommend, the, the memo that you were recommending to the Appropriations Committee? Yeah. There was, um, I believe there was something related to this program. It was 250 yeah. I don't know. But, um, I don't you think. As well. You're asking about the appropriations? No. The appropriations? Yeah. Well, no. yeah. I kind of think it was too. I do remember there was something in the appropriations letter about this too. But, but this is not, I mean, it's, it's, this is from efficiency of money, and it's right. not out of the uh, budget. That right. is, that's right. right. Yeah. So that's why I'm, that's why I'm, I'm puzzled about that. I don't know what actually ended up in the appropriations bill, but I, I do think this committee was asked to comment on in, in your memo. Yeah. That. It, it would be under Ellen's name on our website. I think she was the primary drafter of this. Oh, oh uh, the appropriations letter. I'm thinking about the bill of the past. The appropriations bill? Yeah. 542. Well, yeah. Extensive agreement with efficiency Vermont to support efficiency staff and PGS. So that was from our. This was this from Kitty's handout. Oh, and what did you say? Sorry. Mm -hmm. and, and does it say something about this? It says extends agreement with efficiency from lot to support efficiency staff and BGS. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. It sounds like this. Yes. Yeah, my recollection is that that language mirrored this language. So there was no appropriation. Um. I would have to go back and look at it, but I, I think it was taking, it was essentially just doing the same extension of the preliminary period that this is doing. So, so if, it, if it's efficiency for Vermont money, it wouldn't be an extended allocation. Correct. I don't know. I, I was going to ask if it, if, if it stays in the, uh, if that language stays in the budget, um, is this bill necessary or? Um, so this bill isn't appropriating money, but I think that um, I, I just have to check what's in the budget. I, my, my recollection was that it, it was similar language, um, that it was doing essentially the same thing. So I, I just have to double check that and I can get back to you on it. Okay. Yeah, well, this bill just authorizes continuing the program for another couple of years. <coughs> that we heard from um, 
fishes in Vermont that the idea was, and I don't know if it's in, the, in here somewhere, that the program would continue beyond that, but it would be self-funded. It would be funded by savings. Right, so this so this that. language is saying that at the end of the, the 2023 fiscal year, there would be another report just to give recommendations on how the program could continue. <coughs> so I think that could include recommendations for how it would be funded in the future. Okay, but there's nothing in here about um, setting aside the, the, the savings or earmarking the savings somehow so that they could continue to fund the positions to continue to improve no. efficiency. So I would say as an aside, um, kind of stage whisper to Sarah, that I, I would be interested, and I don't think we need to have a lot of time, but if we could have someone from um, Agency Vermont come in and just kind of give us some background and feedback on this program and um, you know to the extent BGS would like to weigh in too. It doesn't have to be extensive but just understanding part of this is BGS is here. It's like magic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dan Edson for the record of the state energy program manager. Uh, do you want to pull up a chair just to show it? Sure. <clears throat> BGS certainly would love, love to weigh in on it. Okay. To the extent practical. Um, I think uh, I'm trying to remember the, all the questions that were asked. <laughs> um, but uh, let's see. The, uh, the program um, is a preliminary program. Uh, it is funded. Uh, three positions, three full time positions, are funded by Efficiency Vermont. <coughs> uh, the 290 was for the first year, and then in subsequent years, we needed to know exactly what the cost of uh, those employees would be. And that's why it's not an established dollar amount. And uh, Becky was accurate in her assessment of that language. Uh, the, the rough uh, annual uh, spend is $320,000 um, for those three positions. Uh, and yeah, we're we're asking to extend it for for an additional four years. The reason that it says for two uh, four-year periods is because we can't um, have eight-year limited service positions. So we can only have four-year limited service positions, and two of the positions are limited service. Um, and uh, our recommendation is at the the end of the uh, second four-year period that we assess or evaluate. Um, how to uh, fund this program, how to continue to fund it. And is there any, let me start again. I recall hearing something somewhere online, I think it was from a business Vermont, that the, the idea was that the savings would fund the positions after the next four year period. Is there anything in your, in your uh, mind about that? <clears throat> Um, I I can't speak for the position of the commissioner on that topic. We, we do uh, have significant uh, energy savings associated with this program, uh, well above what the um, the statutory requirement of savings is uh, annually. Um, how we fund these positions is through a, uh, or how we fund these projects that we implement are, is through revolving loan funds. And so they are loans, uh, internal loans, and we have to pay back those loans. And our average uh, loan repayment period is 10 years right now. Can you give us some examples of some of the projects that, are, you know, maybe some of the more obvious ones? That sure. Uh, in this building, we've done uh, LED lighting replacement. Uh, done um, HVAC upgrades, things like demand control ventilation where we monitor the CO2 in this level, oh, CO2 levels in this room, and then we can uh, ramp up the uh, fan speeds or slow them down based on how many people are in here. Uh, That's why it's so windy. So, so we don't have any 
excuse for all the sleep. Right? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, and we've done an uh, extensive amount of insulation uh, in the attic space as well. Uh, and How air about ceiling. Ice uh, <laughs> there is, there are ice dams. <laughs> that's that's Vermont. Can't fix those. So you've done a lot of work on this building. Can you just speak at a very high level, kind of generally, about state buildings around? I mean, is it is it, um, is it mostly electric efficiency work? Is there any thermal work that's being done? There's a significant amount of thermal work. I think we've done 52 projects since I've been on board, uh, and we've hit all but two counties. Um, and a huge aspect of our program is also uh, our solar program as well. We currently offset roughly 18% of our electric load in the state buildings. And that's been done in four years? Uh, that's been done in four and a half years since I was hired. Um, so the Efficiency Vermont has a requirement that the, their actions have a, a return greater than the cost of them. And they're somewhere around two to one right now, I believe, for the benefit, cost benefit ratio. This looks to me like, so it's 320,000 for the positions, and then there's the cost of, well, so 320,000 for the positions, and it, has to return at least three hundred thousand dollars value. It says which is a little under one to one. Is uh, this have the same fifty annually in returns? That is, is the requirement. Uh, last year we saved three hundred and eighty four thousand uh, dollars, and that's that's uh, one year. So next year we will save an additional. Three hundred eighty thousand plus whatever plus we at least at, at least yeah um, yeah and so yeah uh, I've crunched the numbers from a, a taxpayer's perspective. Uh, Efficiency Vermont has to worry about ratepayers. Mm -hmm. uh, a significant amount of our energy consumption is in Burlington as well, uh, and so Efficiency Vermont can't uh, count those savings. Um, they are able to count the, some of the thermal savings as well associated with our projects, but not all of them. And so from Fish Vermont's perspective, it's primarily a dollar value on the kilowatt that they save, right? But from the state's perspective, and those uh, dollars that we are, you know, sworn to a, a hold, um, we save a significant uh, amount greater on the dollar spent. Do you restrict your your spending by um, efficiency utility territory? No. So you just it goes in the pot and you spend it on state buildings. Yep. So we evaluate all of our all of our assets, all of our buildings, and we look at um, what buildings are performing the worst uh, on a per square foot basis and cost per square foot basis, and then we have a prioritized list from one to two hundred and seventy. And we start with one, and we evaluate that building. We do an energy audit on it, um, and then we implement the recommendations of the audit. How far down the list are you? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're getting down there. Uh, some buildings it just doesn't make sense to, to do as much as other buildings. Um, so I, I believe we've done 52 projects so far. Yeah. Uh, that's right. Uh, does efficiency remark also provide <coughs> staff support? They do, uh, in the agreement, they provide uh, the equivalency of one full-time staff member. Um, they're providing, you know, that multiple, support regardless. Mul mul multiple people, but, but, um, yeah. but in effect, one, one, one FTE. Yeah. Lauren? So, in addition to this program for our state buildings, do we have any program that is looking at um, resiliency and mitigating threats from climate change? Um, I'm not sure. Do you know I what I mean? I understand your question. Okay. So we had a pretty significant impact to the Waterbury complex mm -hmm. during Erie. So in terms of the rest of our state buildings, do we have a program that is also looking at you know, have we mitigated any kind of 
flooding or um, I, I think damage. that's probably the uh, agency of natural resources would be better equipped to answer that question. With regard but, to the state buildings? With regard to all buildings, yeah. We, we would rely on them in terms of those expertise, for sure. Yeah. And you're, are you, so you're not aware of a program that is I am not aware of a program that looks at that, but again, I am not the person that would be equipped to answer that. So, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> so the uh, types of buildings that uh, the state owns, you, you've got big buildings like the tax building there, the tax department, and you've got the state house, um, and you've got buildings that are basically old residences like the uh, pink lady over here. Um, which, ones, which ones require the most uh, efficiency improvement? Require the most efficiency improvement. Can you um, categorize them by the different types I mean, of buildings? I mean, so all of our buildings require a significant amount of maintenance now annually. And, and yet I could look at every single building and say there is some you know, energy efficiency improvement uh, potential there. Um, we look at it uh, in terms of uh, what buildings are, uh, if, if we expend money on them, are going to have the greatest impact to our entire portfolio. Um, and those buildings have been uh, the larger energy consumers, um, like uh, 108 Cherry Street and 32 Cherry Street in Burlington, or um, 109 uh, State Street or 133 State Street, those larger ones. Mm -hmm. Courthouses are, are big consumers. Our correctional facilities are probably the largest consumers. Um, following up on Laura's question, uh, I guess one fairly simple metric uh, around resiliency would be uh, the ability of, of buildings to coast without power. Is that, is that a metric that you're that, that Yes, you're so I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, aware of, of that metric. And um, we, um, we look at uh, flexible load management um, and partner with GMP and other utilities to look at how uh, we can, you know, when they're monitoring the grid and have identified peak load periods, how we can, uh, during peak load time, as I'm sure you know, has now shifted to 4 to 8 o'clock um, due to the amount of solar that's produced in, you know, in the state. Um, we can uh, be notified of when a peak period might hit and then offset our buildings, set them back temperature-wise so that they're coasting for that time period uh, and reducing the amount of energy consumed. That's, that's that's one thing, but the reason that yeah. we can do that in particular buildings is because the uh, air sailing insulation has been upgraded, right. and we've also spent a significant amount of money on the building automation system to be able to schedule the, the yeah. controls there. Right, right. Yeah. Anyway, that is that is that is something you're looking at specifically. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I know that the Waterbury State Office of Complex was also built to. Um, uh, be flood resistant up to uh, or above the 100 year and somewhere in between the 500 year. Um, and I know that that uh, definition has changed uh, in the last few years. Yeah, <laughs> in the years in the past, but um, that's certainly something that uh, occurred during the rebuild at, at the Water Race Yards and was a FEMA requirement as well.